disclaimer. The purpose of this film is not to give you professional Rockefeller propagandized medical advice regurgitated from controlled Big Pharma textbooks. Consult your nearest Rockefeller licensed doctor for any such drivel. Esoteric Biochemistry The Secret Potassium versus Poison COVID-19 and coronaviruses are not what we are told they are. Even our ancients knew this. The big secret and even bigger joke is, if you are afraid of COVID-19, you are simply afraid of yourself. Our medical books tell us that respiratory syncytial viruses, such as adenoviruses and coronaviruses, are outbreaks of the common cold due to respiratory syncytial virus peak during the winter and spring months. While in the one breath these medical books tell us that coronaviruses are just the common cold, in the other breath we are told we still don't really know the cause of the common cold. From now on, we doesn't mean you. Just because this knowledge is forbidden, occulted and hidden from our doctors and virologists in their Rockefeller controlled medical curriculum does not mean this information isn't known. It's time we all lift the veil and learn. Know thyself, heal thyself. Notice that the etymology of the word virus comes from the 1300s from the Latin word virus, which means poison or poisonous fluid, which comes from the old Irish Aryan Hyperborean phi and the Welsh gwi, which means poison. It does not mean tiny flying invisible unicorn bug. A look at any esoteric or even regular biochemistry book from before Rockefeller controlled medicine took hold, such as this one around 1932, shows that viruses don't even exist and the subject of virulent diseases is short and to the point, not because they didn't know any better, but because they already knew what it really was and Rockefeller and Carnegie could not profit from the simple cure, potassium. But what does virulent mean? It means full of corrupt or poisonous matter. Why is it that COVID-19 or every other flu or common cold kills the elderly and our babies but puts the rest of us on a couch for a few days? It's because oil is truly a fuel, a solvent, a lubricator and purifier for man's body as well as machinery. And you thought the Rockefellers only dealt in oil for your automobile? Guess again. Oil's value as a medicine was well known by our ancients. Its recognition as a neutralizer of poisons or viruses is proved by the following quote from the Odes of Horus, like poison loathes oil. We discovered in the 1930s that leprosy can be cured by the use of a certain oil. Why does the fake COVID-19 look like it targets the elderly? In old age, the human body is very low in oil and hence looks dry and shriveled. Skin, hair, intestinal tracts and bones all require their full quota of oil. The fluid in the lymphatic glands or lymph system must have sufficient oil. 
People age. They try to find ways to pre preserve their appearance. And a Florida woman says she has found the fountain of youth. News Channel 5's Tanya Rogers joins us now with this special report. Tanya? Well, Jane Chan and I have had several people ask me, how old is she? She is a grandmother, and she is eligible for a senior citizen discount. Her quest started because she wanted to feel healthy and have lots of energy. But she has reaped more benefits than she anticipated. And, and here we have some ginger. Annette Larkins shows off her garden in her Miami-Dade County backyard. It's full of fruits and vegetables. Every corner of her garden has something that is edible. And I've been eating them and they're so good. She also collects rainwater to drink and water her plants. Annette says the food in her garden is her fountain of youth. I'm very vibrant. I have lots of energy. As I told you before, I'm up at uh, no later than 5.30 in the morning as a rule and I'm ready to go. Annette's husband owned a meat store in the 1960s. That's when she became a vegetarian. But as the years went by, she became a raw vegan. She does not eat any animal products. Her food is unprocessed and uncooked. My diet consists of fruits, nuts, vegetables, and seeds. I do a lot of sprouting of seeds. And as you can see from my garden, of course, these are the raw foods that I eat. Annette also juices fruits and veggies. You name it, she can juice it. Grapefruits, pineapples, even spinach. But not everyone in the Larkins family eats and drinks this way. Annette's husband of almost 54 years chose to continue to eat the way he did when they were first married. I really wish I would have uh, did what she's done. Amos Larkin says people even wonder if Annette is his wife. They'll ask me what am I doing with a young girl. Or uh, they'll say, uh, you got your granddaughter with you. You know, and... Uh, <laughs> Things like that, you know. Amos takes prescription medicines daily for high blood pressure and diabetes. Annette says she doesn't even take an aspirin. Because friends and strangers kept asking her questions about her health and youthful appearance, she decided to publish two Journey to Health booklets, and she produced a DVD 12 years ago. Discovery Channel, they had me to, they took sections of the booklet and translated them into Spanish, which, by the way, is my second language. So how old is this size four beauty? Annette just turned 70 years old. This one lady who is my age, she said, to, you know, to, was telling her friend that I used to tell them about eating and they wouldn't listen. And she, her, her uh, reply was to that or her response to that was, uh, look at her now and look at us. She's an amazing person, though. Oh, man. I mean, I mean, really, she do everything. I mean, build computers, oh, she's make all her own clothes, grow her own food, speak three languages. You know, I, it's amazing. Now, Annette has been eating completely raw for 27 years. And we want to remind everyone, no matter how old you think she really looks, she changed her lifestyle to feel better and have a good quality of life. And her husband says, I wish I had done what she did. And I said, well, is it too late? He goes, yes, too late for me. <laughs> she looks fantastic. But in this day and age, you know, a lot of people ask me, has she had plastic surgery? She hasn't. Um, she said she hasn't had any plastic surgery. She said, but never say never. Because she said, maybe when I'm 80, I might change my mind. But she hasn't had any plastic surgery. And it's really neat because he says she's so beautiful. And he says when he wants to get help, when he goes to, like, the grocery store or something, he says, Annette, you walk in front of me because you get all the attention. And then I'll be able to ask the questions. Works out in his favor precious. there. And her kids, her two boys are in their 50s, early 50s. Yeah. How, how was the orange juice? I saw you tasting it. It was very was good. It good. And she literally drinks all that through, like, a week or two weeks. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. It's a full-time job, I'm sure, prepping that food. It is. Tanya. Great story, Tanya. Very enlightening right. and eye-opening. Thank right. you. You're welcome. <laughs> Do you think Annette's worried about COVID-19? It is said that the ocean contains enormous quantities of calisulf, or potassium sulfate, in addition to the other three combinations of this potassium salt. It is highly electric. Liebig stated many years ago that potassium is the essential alkali of the animal body and this is true of the human body. In combination with sulfur, it forms oil, or calisulf, potassium sulfate. What do you mean, alkali? A carbonate or hydroxide of an alkali metal, slippery like oil, caustic and characteristically basic in reactions, 
any of a various soluble mineral salts found in natural waters and arid soils? Do you mean like hydroxychloroquine or chlorine dioxide? Oh! Is this why Rockefeller controlled Big Pharma immediately labels the term quack to any virologist who insists things like my bottom line still holds the truth that the terrain or internal environment is everything and the germ or so-called virus is nothing the germ or so-called virus can only be a symptom of cellular breakdown due to an imbalance of the delicate alkaline pH balance of the body's fluids or oils and not the cause of that breakdown. It is said that bodies of sheep, salmon, clams, and milk contain a huge quantity of potassium sulfate. For vegans and vegetarians, beet greens like spinach, kale, white beans, avocados, potatoes, acorn squash, white button mushrooms, bananas, tomatoes, wheat, yeast, rice bran, molasses, soybeans, figs, seaweed, orange juice, Brussels sprouts, pistachios, sunflower seeds, palm hearts, pumpkin and squash and seeds, almonds, watermelon seeds, dates, cashews and walnuts contain the same. Two vegans walk into a bar. I only know because they told everybody immediately. Anyway, it is said that the body of sheep contain a huge quantity of potassium sulfate salt, which may be the reason why mutton fat is supposed to possess healing qualities. Sheep are said to excrete a very great quantity of potassium in their perspiration and one-third of the weight of raw merino Spanish sheep consists of potassium compounds. Here again, we have esoteric proof that the correct allocation of potassium phosphate to Aries, the cerebrum, or the sheep or lamb sign, as well as to Virgo, the virgin, which creates the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world, as sins means deficiency and also disease. The statement is clear. Lack of potassium or calium as it is chemically known in all three combinations causes virulent and poisonous diseases. Let's repeat that extraordinary statement again. Lack of potassium sulfate, potassium chloride and potassium phosphate causes viruses and poisonous disease. The word disease is exactly what it says. It is cellular dis-ease. This is what is meant when you hear the statement, the terrain is everything, the germ is nothing. You have as much chance of catching potassium deficiency from bats pigs and coughing people as you do catching acne from a teenager and we'll get into the experiments that prove this later in this film. In fact the entire pharmaceutical and vaccine industry is based on a 240 year old germ theory. Have you ever asked why it's still a theory and not proven after all of that time? Back to potassium. Potassium phosphate makes up the cells in Aries, the ram or lamb of God, which is our body's cerebrum, the higher God mind brain that gives directives to our motor cerebellum to make the body do what we desire it to do and to start the alchemical processes to heal toxicity in the rest of the body. It also makes up the electric spinal cord, sensory nerves, and even the cells in our face to lower jaw, which is one of the main toxic ejection centers of the body through nasal cavities and the mouth for lung phlegm ejection. If you've ever been down with the flu or a bad cold, you know very well how much activity is going on in this region to eject toxins 
stuffy or runny nose, cough, fever, headache, etc. But you also know that if you go to the pharmacy, the first thing they do is give you Tamiflu, nasal sprays, cough suppressants, and a plethora of drugs that shut down your body's ability to eject toxins this way, leaving them running amok in your body, doing all kinds of irreparable cellular destruction. Sure, these products short-circuit the Aries sensory nerve centers to make you feel better, in the same way a bottle of whiskey and two grams of cocaine make you forget that your arm is broken. But your arm is still broken. We somehow accept this as medicine. By no coincidence, potassium chloride is allocated to Gemini, the twins, named after our lungs, and make up the cells of the lungs, the pleura glands that cover our lungs, our bronchial tubes, and our body's fiber and tissues. Not only are the lungs where ferrum or iron in the red blood cells called hemoglobin carry oxygen to the rest of our body, but they are also another vital excretion point for toxic ejection through the mouth and nose. We'll get back to iron shortly. In the meantime, think of the role the lungs play in flu, colds, pneumonia, and all of these so-called respiratory viral diseases and deaths. Have you ever asked, if viruses are little magical unicorn bugs, why not take a tissue sample from anywhere else in the other 90% of your wet multi-trillion cellular body and see if you find them there? Why are we only testing potassium cellular centers of the body? Shouldn't these bugs be everywhere? If they can fly, surely they can swim. But back to Virgo and potassium sulfate, the solar plexus and the bowels, the other excretion point of toxins. Surely you've had diarrhea during the flu and the essential oils that destroy viruses or cellular poisons. People who are deficient in potassium sulfate suffer from virulent diseases and are easily poisoned by tainted foods. They should be extremely careful relative to their diet and toxic flu shots as well, as potassium sulfate acts as a fuel, deficiency in it will cause a person to feel suffocated and he suffers greatly under certain atmospheric conditions. As the polar opposite of Virgo is Pisces, the fishes, allocates with ferrum or iron and makes up arterial blood and red corpuscles, the above symptom is usually aggravated when insufficient oxygen is obtained. Lack of iron causes depression, discouragement, and a feeling as if one were absolutely crushed since the air pressure on the body is much greater than that within. The blood is thus poisoned and will eventually become very putrid, especially as potassium deficiency always accompanies lack of iron. Combustion cannot take place in the absence of air an infallible modality indicative of potassium sulfate deficiency is a rise of temperature in the afternoon or early evening. The spiritual inspiration of God and man gives spiritual power and physical life. The word inspiration literally means to breathe in. Iron attracts oxygen in which is the breath of life that which elevates, lifts up, and inspires. As the fluid of the body becomes depleted in iron, the corpuscles, or the fish germs of Pisces, slowly suffocate and eventually putrefy. This is the true cause of cancer. Without iron, combustion cannot go on. Potassium sulfate and ferrum iron are then the legitimate cure for this putrid and virulent disease. In Latin, the word ferrum is derived from the word ferro, 
meaning to bear, to bring, to carry. And this is the true nature of this magnetic salt. It bears, brings, and carries oxygen, the breath of life, the spirit of God in man. Where strength and firmness are required, iron is used. Our strongest machinery is made of it. Iron and steel are used for the framework of buildings. Its use in the body is exactly the same, for strength. Therefore, in attracting oxygen, spirit, into the body, humanity is supplied with the strength to endure, to live, and to fight for the right. And so, when we are lacking in all three potassiums and iron, we get catarrhal conditions of the head and throat, which is inflammation of mucous membranes of the nose and air passages, often with slimy yellow or greenish matter. We get stuffy colds, fevers, bronchitis, coughs, pneumonia, whooping cough, rattling and gurgling of mucus in the chest, fungoid inflammation of the joints and even blood poisoning basically what you call a bad cold or the flu this is a color stained micrograph of an aggregation of infected red blood cells with the phantom coronavirus these so-called infected cells are nothing more than biological transforming red blood cells that are going through pleomorphic changes due to increased acidity and a declining pH value of less than 7.2. The biological transformation of blood or body cells is a natural process that takes place in an acidic environment of the interstitial fluids of the interstitium compartments and then spilling over into the blood plasma via hydrostatic pressure caused by the buildup of dietary and metabolic acidic waste which has not been properly eliminated by the lymphatic system via the four channels of elimination urination defecation perspiration and or respiration by now, you've probably heard concerns that Cinco G uses multiple frequencies, including this 60 gigs, which stops the hemoglobin in your blood from taking up oxygen and being able to deliver it to the rest of your body, and that many doctors have come forward and are claiming the ventilators are suffocating and killing their patients, not helping them. You can pump as much oxygen into your lungs as you like, but it doesn't work if the lungs are not able to deliver it to the rest of your body. Would it be wise to start taking cell salt supplements of ferrum iron and potassium sulfate, chloride and potassium phosphate daily now that these towers are going up everywhere while you're in lockdown? Do you think a vaccine that contains zero iron or potassium is going to make you immune from this problem? The point of this film is not to give you any medical advice, only information so that you can make that decision for yourself. Association does not mean causation. Imagine every time you see an airplane or helicopter, you notice they always have windows on them, and therefore windows must be the reason these vehicles are able to fly. Or saying that since cats share 90% of our human genes, we must be cats. Unfortunately, that's exactly how Rockefeller Big Pharma PCR tests and germ theory works. They assume that because they find partial genetic materials in the fluids of the body's cellular potassium centers that have 80% matches to genetic materials they found in some other sick person and that they claim to be viruses even though an alleged virus has still never been completely 100 percent isolated and proven to this day that they must be viruses and must also be the cause of disease because they're always there just like windows are always on planes and helicopters that are flying if a PCR test finds a genetic material in your fluid is a 90% match to a cat, 
you must be a cat. So this is uh, an example of how you could be misled by your observations and assume that it's a contagious process that passes an illness between people when in actuality it is that they had a common exposure to some kind of toxic insult that caused the problem. All at the same time and in, in mass. OK, look. OK, so let me just play devil's advocate. So are, are there things in life that cause contagion? Like, you know, let's say, you know, people call it the Spanish flu of 1918. It was was that actually a contagious event? Well, it, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, because there is a book called The Invisible Rainbow by Arthur Furstenberg, and it describes that right after the Spanish flu pandemic, which, by the way, resulted in 50 million deaths. Right. Okay, so that is way, 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 way more than our current situation. But the U.S. Public Health Service they did a series of three experiments with people. They did some additional animal experiments as well. But the experiments with the humans, they, they had 100 healthy subjects. And then they had several people who were sick with the flu. So what they did is they had the people who were sick with the flu uh, cough up as much nasty stuff as they could. They uh, put swabs in their nose to collect the snot. They even swabbed their eyeballs. So they were trying to collect all of the particles that they thought were infectious that they could then deliver to a healthy person and make them sick. So in the first experiment, what they did is they uh, squirted these secretions um, into the nose, eyes, and uh, throat of the healthy people. And out of those 100 healthy people, not one of them became ill with the flu. So they thought, well, we need to try harder, and they devised a second experiment. In the second experiment, they took the same secretions from the sick person who was coughing and sneezing and tearing, and they then injected that into the healthy subjects. And once again, none of the subjects became ill with the flu. So they devised a third experiment thinking that perhaps a more natural, casual human contact is required for transmission of the disease. And so what they did is they had the person who was sick with the flu sit really close, like uncomfortably close to the healthy subject. And they had a conversation for like five or 10 minutes, I forget the exact time. And then after that, they had the sick individual take a deep breath in and the healthy individual take a deep breath out and they put their lips together almost as if they were kissing, but no contact. And the sick person blew all of his breath into the healthy person who inhaled it all. And the results of that experiment once again showed that none of the healthy subjects became ill. So. I've tried very hard to find additional experiments where they tested this theory about contagion of infectious agents, and I could not find any conclusive studies that proved contagion exists. Why viral? Because the people are poisoned, they excrete toxins, they look like viruses, people think it's, an, it's a flu epidemic. In the 1918 the uh, epidemic, the Boston Health Department decided to investigate the contagiousness of this. So they, believe it or not, took hundreds of people with the flu and they sucked the snot out of their nose and injected it into the healthy people who didn't have the flu. And not one time could they make the next person sick. They did this over and over again. And they were not able to demonstrate contagion. They even did it with horses who apparently got the Spanish flu and they put bags over their head and the horses sneezed in the bag and they put the bag over the next horse and not one horse got sick. You can read about this in a book called The Invisible Rainbow by Arthur Furstenberg who chronicles all the steps in the electrification of the earth and how within six months there was a new flu pandemic all over the world. And when you invest, when you hear the normal uh, explanations, how did it go from Kansas to South Africa in two weeks? So the entire world got the symptoms at the same time, in spite of the fact that the mode of transportation was horseback and boats, and there's no explanation for it. 
They just say, we don't know how that happened. Germ theory has been so widely accepted as a fundamental principle that all of our other scientific knowledge is based upon. There has been no effort or funding or research done to look for an alternative cause. And why do you think that is? Well, uh, you know, from the point of view of scientists, they since they accept that the virus causes the disease, there would be no point in doing other research to look at other po potential causes. And so they uh, spend their research efforts to learn more about these particles that they're calling viruses. And furthermore, um, the way research is done is that uh, because scientific research is extremely expensive. So there are some private foundations with endowments that do fund a very, very small percentage of the scientific research, but the overwhelming majority is funded by government grants. And the way this apparatus works is that the different government agencies uh, that are part of the Nas National Institutes of Health um, and the National Science Foundation they have specific research goals and areas that they want to study. So they put out these publications that describe the, the type of uh, subjects that they want research done, and that's what they're going to fund. So they're not putting out uh, grants to look for alternative causes of these diseases because they're not interested in that. So the sad part is that government health agencies are revolving doors for big pharma executives with major shareholdings whose interests lie in profiting from multi-billion dollar annual sales of vaccines, antibiotics, prescriptions, and over-the-counter remedies. They have no interest in committing financial self-destruction or industry suicide by funding more studies that disprove the germ theory. More frightening is the fact that the world is on government-ordered lockdown and people are afraid to stand six feet from each other over an unproven virus with very little symptoms and an extremely low mortality rate of only 240,000 people dead in over four and a half months while during the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic, which was allegedly so contagious and deadly, it killed 50 or 60 million people in just a few months, scientific experiments weren't able to infect even one person or horse in many, many hundreds of attempts of prolonged intimate physical contact, even by injection. Let that sink in. Just for the record, 1918 was the coldest winter on record until 1938, 1960, and 1979. So people were indoors and lacking vitamin D from sun exposure. As Arthur Furstenberg wrote in The Invisible Rainbow in 2001, Canadian astronomer Ken Tapping showed that the influenza pandemics over the previous 300 years correlated with peaks in solar magnetic activity on an 11-year cycle. Once again, 1918, 1938, 1960, and 1979 correlate. It has also been found that some outbreaks of influenza spread over enormous areas in just a few days, a fact that is difficult to explain by contagion from one person to another. Also numerous experiments seeking to prove direct contagion through close contact, droplets of mucus or other processes have proved fruitless. From 1933 to the present day, Virologists have been unable to present any experimental study proving that influenza spreads through normal contact between people. All attempts to do so have met with failure. On top of that, wireless radio transmitters replacing the old wired telegraph system were put up all over the world at around that same time 
adding a new cellular biological toxin we had yet to evolve through. To add insult to injury, after Bayer lost its aspirin patent in 1915 and the great aspirin and phenol wars began, chemists were pressing millions of aspirin in powder pills and people were popping them like candy for the flu, unaware that fever is essential for removing cellular toxins from the body and stopping that fever can mean death, never mind the other obvious health risks of overdosing on aspirin. On top of that, 1918 was the first worldwide mass vaccination program. Dr. Eleanor McBean, author of The Poison Needle, was a young girl during the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic. As she points out, the soldiers were getting sick and dying because they were given anywhere from 14 to 25 vaccine shots during the First World War. The First World War was of a shorter duration than anticipated, so the vaccine makers were unable to use up all their vaccines. As they were and still are in business for profit, they decided to sell it to the rest of the population. So they drummed up the largest vaccination campaign in history. There were no epidemics to justify it, so they used other tricks. Their propaganda claimed the soldiers were coming home from foreign countries with all kinds of diseases and that everyone must have all of the shots on the market. The people believed them because, first of all, they wanted to believe their doctors, and second, the returning soldiers certainly had been sick and dying. The people didn't know it was from doctor-made vaccine diseases, as the army doctors don't tell them things like that. Many of the returned soldiers were disabled for life by these drug-induced diseases. Many were insane from post-vaccinal encephalitis, but the doctors called that shell shock, even though many of the soldiers had never left American soil. The conglomerate of disease brought on by the many poison vaccines baffled the doctors, as they had never had a vaccination spree before which used so many different vaccines. The new disease they had created had the symptoms of all of the diseases they had injected into people. There was high fever, extreme weakness, abdominal rash, intestinal disturbance, lung congestion, chill and fever, swollen sore throat clogged with the false membrane, and the choking suffocation because of difficulty breathing, followed by gasping and death, after which the body turned black from stagnant blood that had been deprived of oxygen in the suffocation stages. In the early days, they called it the Black Death. They wanted to direct the blame away from themselves, so they called it Spanish Influenza. It was certainly not of Spanish origin, and the Spanish people resented the implications that the worldwide scourge of that day should be blamed on them. But the name stuck, and American medical doctors and the vaccine makers were not suspected of the crime of this widespread devastation the 1918 flu epidemic. Eleanor wrote, That pandemic dragged on for two years, kept alive with the addition of more poison drugs administered by doctors who tried to suppress the symptoms. As far as she could find out, the flu hit only the vaccinated. Those who had refused the shots escaped the flu. Her family had refused all the vaccinations, so they remained well at the time. They seemed to be the only family which didn't get the flu, so her parents went from house to house doing what they could to look after the sick, as it was impossible to get a doctor then. If it were possible for germs, bacteria, virus, or bacilli to cause disease, they had plenty of opportunity to attack her parents, when they were spending many hours a day in the sick rooms. But they didn't get the flu and they didn't bring any germs home to attack the children 
or cause anything. None of her family had the flu, not even a sniffle. She wrote, When I see people cringe when someone near them sneezes or coughs, I wonder how long it will take them to find out that they can't catch it, whatever it is. The only way they can get a disease is to develop it themselves by wrong eating, drinking, smoking, or doing some other things which cause internal poisoning and lowered vitality. Dr. McBean seems to have the same conviction as the great pioneers of biochemistry, like Dr. Schusler, Dr. Carey, or Dr. Perry, who state, in cases of boils or carbuncle, the biochemist loses or wastes no time searching for anthrax bacilli or germs, nor does he experiment with imaginary germ-killing serum. He simply furnishes nature with tools with which the necessary work may be accomplished. Which brings us back to biochemistry, iron and potassium. The so-called diseases that Rockefeller Big Pharma claims are contagious flying protein capsules are the exact same cellular diseases, or rather mineral cell salt deficiencies that are quickly, easily, and cheaply cured by simple biochemistry. In the case of potassium chloride deficiency, the spinning process stops and our threads thicken and tangle and the parts feel enlarged, congested, and swollen. The thread or fiber takes up too much room. This is the true explanation for swellings glandular enlargements, etc. Thick blood or embolus results from the need of this salt, causing the heart to work harder as more energy is required to circulate the blood. Biochemistry states that potassium chloride is specific for children's diseases, for they have to do with disturbances in the fibrin and are usually accompanied by exudations through the skin as in scarlet fever, measles, chicken pox. Your kids do not catch chicken pox. Mother's milk is loaded with potassium chloride and they weren't breastfed until age four. So they are simply expressing fibrin disturbances and embolism at roughly the same age. Association does not mean causation. Remember, Windows do not make airplanes fly. Swollen glands, throat irritation, tonsillitis, mumps, etc. And to the degree in which iron or ferrum phosphate is deficient, fever will manifest. Other physical symptoms arising from lack of potassium chloride are stuffy colds in the head, catarrh, mumps, smallpox, pneumonia, and even coughs. Smallpox, potassium chloride deficiency, and not a contagious virus? But wait a minute. The entire vaccine industry was started on the assumption that the smallpox epidemic was curable by exposure to a contagious cowpox virus. Let's bring this film home by going back to the 1700s and the real origin of germ theory and using our new knowledge see if we can find the fallacy and potassium connection. The environmental terrain of the 1700s was riddled with famine coming out of the Maunder Grand Solar Minimum. It was also a century of constant epidemics of iron and potassium nutritional deficiencies understandably. In the 1720s, when leeches were used to blood let out evil spirits, inoculation came to Europe in hopes of curing the smallpox. You have to remember, biochemistry wasn't rediscovered until a hundred years later. Inoculation was done by inserting or rubbing powdered smallpox scabs or fluid from pustules into superficial scratches made in the skin. Seeing as pustules are poisonous toxins 
trapped in mucus that the body is trying to eject through the skin, unsurprisingly, the patient would develop pustules identical to those caused by natural occurring smallpox, since the doctor just rubbed the exact same poisonous toxins into that area. After about two to four weeks, the patient's symptoms would subside after removing the poisons rubbed into them, indicating to the doctors successful recovery and immunity. In 1783, the Lockheed super eruption rained down 122 megatons of poisonous sulfur dioxide for eight months straight all over Europe causing famines that were killing people and animals who were eating contaminated grass, as well as crops. The huge discharge affected other parts of Europe for many years, including England, where our hero, Dr. Edward Jenner, comes in. Jenner had always been fascinated by the rural old wives' tale that milkmaids could not get smallpox, he believed that there was a connection between the fact that milkmaids only got a weak version of smallpox, the non-life-threatening cowpox, but did not get smallpox itself. A milkmaid who had caught cowpox got blisters on her hands, and Jenner concluded that it must be the pus in the blisters that somehow protected the milkmaids. Jenner decided to try out his new theory. Rather than experiment on himself, he found a young boy named James Phipps to be his guinea pig. He took some pus from what he thought were cowpox blisters found on the hands of a milkmaid named Sarah Nelms. She had milked a pox-ridden cow named Blossom and had developed the telltale blisters. Jenner injected her pus into James. He repeated the process over nine days gradually increasing the amount of pus he put into the boy. He then injected James with pus from Blossom the cow. James became ill, unsurprisingly, but after a few days made a full recovery with no side effects. Jenner thought he had made a brilliant discovery. But had he? For starters, it was the century of famine and there was certainly one going on at that time. What do you think most milkmaids were living on for their sustenance? Mother's milk, especially from cows, is loaded in potassium chloride and potassium phosphate and even the perfect amount of sulfur to be converted into potassium sulfate. Even if the mother is deficient herself, nature will allocate the nutrients to her milk to ensure the survival of her children and her species. Famine-starving milkmaids living off potassium-rich cow milk all day would obviously therefore not express smallpox from potassium deficiency. Some of the milkmaids did, however, express pox on their hands and palms. This is what is now known as shedding. The skin is a porous organ and if you are touching poisonous, toxin-ridden blisters on cow teat all day, you are absolutely going to absorb those same poisons into your hands. It is the same reason inoculation was performed and the same reason you are told to wash your hands after wiping your ass or handling poisonous chemicals or rotten food. Jenner was no doubt a brilliant country doctor for his time, but he was no Columbo, and definitely not a scientist, just like our friend Kill Bill. Jenner had no scientific control group or gold standard, and he miserably failed all of Cox's postulates, failing to notice that not all milkmaids exposed to cowpox were immune, or that it was their hands and not bodies that had pox, and that many of the farmers and families exposed to the same cows every day for feed and other reasons still had the pox themselves. And this is the scientific basis for the reason you're locked in your house and social distancing.